Today, I'll be going over all the camera gear that you need in order to capture amazing landscape photography. So stick around and let's jump right in. What's up y'all, it's a Project Photography, back with another video, and today, people, today, before we get started, make sure to follow all my socials down in the description bar below. And today, I wanna run through all the camera gear that you're gonna need for landscape photography, and some features to look out for in picking out the right set of camera gear. The first one we have to start off with is obviously a really good camera body. And for me, I have a Nikon Z6. Now, this is an incredible camera that I've been using for my landscape photography for the past, I wanna say, five years or so and I really have enjoyed it a lot. But what you should look out for in a good camera body are a few things. First of all, you have to be very mindful of the sensor that you're using. Full frame sensors versus something like an APS-C size sensor, it's just going to perform very differently. Generally speaking, full frame sensors will be superior over APS-C size sensors for landscape photography for a few reasons. First of all, we are generally gonna get better image quality in areas like dynamic range, which is incredibly important, especially when you're exposing for images for the highlights and then bringing up the shadows in post you're able to retain a lot more detail and get better and cleaner images overall. Another aspect that's really important is the megapixel count. Now, generally speaking, more megapixels will be better. Now, a question of whether or not it's necessary is a definitely a different answer. But generally speaking, if we have a full frame sensor, we can get more megapixels in it versus something like an APS-C size sensor. With a full frame sensor, we will get better image quality overall, better colors and that sort of thing. But you shouldn't just focus on the sensor and the image quality, you have to determine for yourself if that upgrade in uh, sensor is going to make sense relative to the price point. APS-C size sensors will generally be cheaper than a full frame camera. And of course, with APS-C size cameras, we're able to get a little bit cheaper lenses and so forth. If budgetary issues are something you have to worry about, then APS-C size sensors definitely is not a bad route to go. Another aspect that's incredibly important is the screen. Now, of course, if we have a camera that doesn't have a two-way articulating screen or some sort of articulation, it is gonna be much more difficult to see the camera and the screen when it's lower to the ground. Ideally, we would like a three-way articulating screen where the screen will flip out this way, but also flip out this way in the vertical orientation. Now, this is not a feature that's super common in a lot of cameras. You will see more of the two-way tilting screen, but if we even have a fully articulating screen, that can absolutely work because we do get that vertical and horizontal orientation. The camera that you have is not going to be the deal breaker when it comes to your landscape photography. There are other aspects and other pieces of gear that are much more important. Like for example, a really good wide angle lens. For me, I have the Nikon 14 to 30 millimeter F4S. This is an incredible lens. It's an S line lens. We're going to get better image quality and 14 millimeters on the wide side is incredibly good. Now wide angle lenses are going to be incredibly important and the most important piece of gear that you're going to have in your kit. For for a few reasons. First of all, a wide angle lens is able to capture the entirety of a landscape. You're gonna be using this lens about 90% of the time, as that's where you're gonna be capturing most of your landscape photography. This helps you get everything in the frame, capture more complex compositions. And when you're looking at a wide angle lens, the focal length will be the most important part. You're going to be wanting at least 20 millimeters or wider in terms of full frame equivalent on the wide side of a lens. So this 14 to 30 will work. I also have a 17 to 28 that also works. But if you're considering an APS-C size lens, then you probably want something like a 14 millimeters or wider on the wide side because you have to multiply the focal length by a 1.5 times crop factor. And generally speaking, the wider the focal length, the better. But if you have something like a zoom lens, that's even more of an added bonus. And the other thing you really wanna note is that having an 82 millimeter filter thread or smaller, generally speaking, is gonna be incredibly beneficial because that's where we're gonna get most of our ND filters. And of course, there are lenses with a bulbous front element that's just gonna be a lot harder to get ND filters for. So in terms of image quality for a wide angle lens, we would love to see limited vignetting. If we can get limited vignetting, that'll just make our images a lot cleaner. We wanna sharp in the corners and sharp at the edges and overall really good color rendition. If we can get those three factors in a good wide angle, then we're gonna come out with very good images. And of course, to complement a really nice wide angle lens, we are going to have to have a really nice telephoto lens. Now for me, I use the Nikon 24 to 200 with the Nikon Z30, which turns into an effective 36 to 300. Now that's a really great focal range and especially paired with my 14 to 30, we're able to cover 
14 to 300 all the way through with essentially zero gap. But a really good telephoto lens will help you accomplish a few things. First off, you can capture images like panoramas in particular, or you can really isolate certain subject matters and highlight them in the landscape, especially those far away mountain peaks in particular. And when you're looking for a really good telephoto lens, it's all going to be about the focal range. Generally speaking, you want a lens that's a longer than 200 millimeters on the long side. To me, 200 millimeters is about the shortest that I would go. I mean, this is a 24 to 200, but if you can get something like a 70 to 300, that is absolutely ideal. And of course, when it comes to image quality with a telephoto lens, we are gonna be looking out for a few factors in particular, very similar to the wide angle. We want nice sharp images in the center as well as the corners. And of course we want really minimal vignetting. And this is especially important for panorama images because we don't want those weird dark diagonals to show up in our panoramas. Limited vignetting will definitely solve that issue. And last but not least, really nice color rendition to get nice pleasing images. But there are a few side notes about these camera uh, gear in particular that I really wanna talk about. First of all, when it comes to all this camera gear, you want it to be nice and lightweight. Generally speaking, if we can have lightweight camera gear that is also compact, is much easier to store in our camera bag and it will take up a lot less space. Weather sealing is also an incredibly important aspect when it comes to finding good camera gear because if it's not weather sealed, then the elements can get inside of your camera gear and honestly ruin it. You don't want water to get splashed on your camera and for it to just malfunction all of a sudden. And if you have both a wide angle and a telephoto lens, then having two camera bodies is a bonus. For me, I have a Nikon Z6 and a Nikon Z30 that I used for a telephoto and a wide angle pairing. The main reason why is that when you're using both of those lenses and you wanna switch between the two, you really don't wanna be changing out lenses while you're out shooting. It can cause dust to get inside of your sensor. When you have two cameras, you don't have to even change lenses. You just switch out the camera bodies without having to expose the sensor. So that's also something that's really important, but just a bonus if you can do that. Now let's move on to the tripod. And the tripod that I use is the Peak Design Travel Tripod. Now this is an incredible one. This is one I've had since 2019 and is incredibly robust, survives all the elements and everything I throw at it, and is incredibly stable. And a really good tripod will allow you to do a few things. First of all, you're able to grab very consistent compositions. When you're handheld, there are slight micro movements that might affect your composition overall. With a tripod, we don't have that issue. You can get long exposures because the camera isn't moving, obviously. And you can do different techniques, like, for example, you get Milky Way photos. You can focus stack get panoramas, HDRs, all those different techniques would not be possible without a good tripod. And when you're looking for a really good tripod, stability is incredibly important. You want legs that are nice and strong. And a big part of that obviously is that you want legs that are at least 50 inches tall without the center column extended, of course. And this will allow for a nice stable platform to shoot on. I am a huge fan of having clamps over the turning locks because you can actually see when the tripod legs are locked. And if you can, it's really difficult, especially when you're on location because if you put your camera down, the tripod can collapse on you and you really don't want that to happen. And clamps are also easier to unlock and lock when you're actually extending out the tripod makes it much faster to get your tripod to the correct length. And you want the tripod to be lightweight and compact as well. P Design Travel Tripod is extremely compact. As you can see, it's like the size of a water bottle, I believe they said. Just makes it a lot easier to pack around in your camera bag, especially when you're traveling on an airplane. And last but not least, a quality ball head. Now we're not talking some cheap $20 ball head. You want one that's nice and stable, has nice locking mechanisms, and you want to make sure that when you're locking your camera in place, it doesn't fall out. And so a good ball head is an absolute necessity. And to complement a really nice tripod, getting yourself a nice set of ND filters can really make the difference. Now for me, I have B plus W filters. Now I have a three, six, and a 10 stop. And these are incredible filters. I mean, for me, I really like having strong filters, having these nice range from the six, the three, and the 10 stop allows me to get different images. For example, with a three stop filter, I'm able to get those nice short exposures of half a second to about one second to capture fast water moving in. Whereas a 10 stop filter will allow me to capture even longer exposure. We're talking 30 seconds to even a couple minute exposures. Whereas a six stop filter is a nice in between. If there is a decent amount of light out, I can't really use the three stop to get that half second or one second exposure. The six stop would be perfect for that. But if the light goes down quite a bit, 
can't really use that 10 stop because in our exposure, time is gonna be like 15 minutes. That's just absolutely unreasonable. So a six stop is a nice medium between the three and the 10. And having these different filters allows you to have creative control over your shutter speed in particular. Now this is really important for capturing fast moving clouds, water in particular, and anything that is actually moving. And when it comes to filters, I highly, highly, highly recommend getting the largest size filter you have and then using step up rings which is essentially allows you to put an ND filter onto a lens that isn't the exact same filter size. So for example, my 24 to 200 is a 67 millimeter filter thread. And these filters are 82 millimeters and this allows me to throw that filter on. But if you're gonna be putting any piece of glass in front of your camera lens, you want it to be the nicest glass possible. A few things to look out for in when it turns of uh, image quality is limited vignetting. I feel like I've said this so many times, but limited vignetting on filters is extremely important because if you have limited vignetting, you'll have much cleaner images overall. And one thing to kind of note though, is that as you go from three to six to 10, the stronger the filter is, the more vignetting you will have. So generally speaking, that is something that will be in effect in all filters, but you wanna get filters that don't have extreme vignetting and it can really cause a lot of issues, especially in post-production. But the most important thing to me is having minimal color shift. Now this can turn blues into more of an aqua teal and make images just not as pleasing overall. This can be an absolute mess to clean up in post-production and you can definitely notice it when you put on the filters and having good filters is an absolute must if you are gonna invest in them. And if I had to recommend a good order to get them in, I would start with the 10 stop filter. This will allow you to have the most change in shutter speed when it comes to your images, capture those really nice long exposures. Then I'd move on to the three stop because you can get those nice shorter exposures. And then to the six to bridge the gap, that's the order I'll probably buy them in because these filters are not cheap. Each of these was like $180. Now let's talk about the camera bag. Now having a really good camera bag is super important, especially for landscape photography. If you don't have a good one, it can make the landscape photography experience unpleasant overall. And for me, I have the Shimoda Action X30. This is a nice, lightweight, comfortable, compact, but also not overly big and carry all the gear that I need inside of it. One important feature is having back access. You don't want front access. The reasoning why is that when you put your camera on the ground for front access, it will actually, you know, dirty your straps. And that absolutely sucks because you don't want to be wearing your straps when it's covered in mud or water. So having that back access really changes a lot of that. You're able to access all of your gear from the back only make sure the front gets dirty so that you don't have to worry about your camera straps getting dirty. It makes it a lot easier to switch out lenses or just grab whatever gear you need. When it comes to comfortability, having really nice shoulder straps, hip belt and load lifters is extremely important, especially the hip belt and load lifters. What this allows you to do is take off a lot of that weight off your shoulders and right onto your hip. It allows you to carry it for longer periods of time, makes it so that you don't get as fatigued as fast. I mean, this really makes the landscape experience and hiking far, far more comfortable. And you can also put more weight in your camera bag. Generally speaking though, you want your camera bag to be pretty light, but having more weight would not be as much of an issue if you had the load lifters and hip belt. The next important thing to look out for is weather resistance. Of course, this camera bag, as you can tell, has been beaten quite a bit, but it has a really nice front part that makes it really resistant to the elements. Trust me, this camera bag has gotten wet plenty of times and it's still in very good condition and having that weather resistance is a lot of what I owe that to. And you don't wanna get a camera bag that's too big or too small. To me, 30 liters is like that perfect number. I mean, I am a mirrorless camera user. If you have DSLRs, you might need a 50 liter, but to me, 30 is that really nice sweet spot. And last but not least on the camera bag, we wanna have side pockets because it allows us to put our tripod into it as well as water bottles. Of course, you don't wanna be going on a hike without water, not trying to pass out or anything but this just makes it a lot easier to pack in your tripod. And most camera bags do have that side strap to be able to hold it in like this. So side pockets, an absolute necessity in my opinion. And as a bonus, I have two last pieces of gear. They are both very small. This is an L bracket. What this allows you to do is to put your camera into vertical orientation natively without having to put your camera into horizontal and then tipping it over. It allows for more flexibility in terms of grabbing those compositions and just makes it a lot easier to put your camera into vertical in particular. And then we have a rocket blower. Now this is extremely important, especially when you have dust on your camera sensor and you're on location, you can simply just do that, get rid of the dust, 
And we don't want dust because then that shows up, especially when we're shooting at lower apertures or higher apertures actually like F8, F11. So yeah, guys, that is all the camera gear that I deem to be extremely necessary for landscape photography. Now it does seem like a lot and I absolutely understand that. And don't feel like you have to be so you know, worried about getting everything all at once. I mean, this setup took me years upon years to build. I mean, doing this for eight years and you don't have to feel like you have to have everything all at once. And at the end of the day, it's not about the camera gear you have. It's about the locations you go out and shoot at because if you feel like, okay, I need to have the perfect camera gear to go out and shoot landscape photography, you're never gonna go out and shoot landscape photography. Of course, there are things even in this kit that I would like to improve. But at the end of the day, it's not gonna stop me from going out and creating images. If I had to recommend two pieces of camera gear to start off with, I mean, I'm kind of assuming everyone has a camera body. Putting the camera body aside, I would highly recommend getting the wide angle. I mean, this is gonna be the main lens that you're gonna be using 90% of the time. If you don't have a good wide angle, it's just so hard to capture really good landscapes. And then a tripod. A tripod allows you for just so much more creative flexibility, allows you to get way more techniques in, and allows you to use ND filters, which can allow for you so much more creative control over your shutter speed in particular. And of course, when it comes to the specs, don't feel like you have to get the camera with the perfect specs all the time. Find stuff that fits your need within your budgetary restrictions. And you can obviously upgrade stuff over time. You can sell stuff. That is the ultimate guide for landscape photography camera gear that you will need to capture amazing images. And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section down below. We love to answer your guys' questions. And if you don't really wanna think about the camera gear that you need to go out and get, I have actually all this camera gear in my comment section. So you can go ahead and check out the links for those different pieces of gear. I do have my landscape photography print store open and I just released the national parks collection of all the national parks that I've been to. Uh, it's a really good one. So go ahead and check it out. Thank you guys so much for experiencing the world with me today. Please feel free to rate, comp, subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.